switching gears, uh, Shelly Palmer is going to talk about uh, things digital, and uh, he's, he's known for writing the Meow Mix jingle as well. <laughs> <laughs> he has to be written on my tombstone. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm, supposed to, I'm not supposed to talk about digital media because that's what I do for a living. I actually host a TV show called Digital Life with Shelly Palmer, cleverly named that name. Um, but Fabrice asked me if I would not speak about digital media because everyone in this room is supposed to be a digital media expert. So I will talk about something kind of crazy. On December 2nd, the FCC, the FCC sent a notice of inquiry out, and I know a lot of you don't read FCC notices of inquiry. It was based on a letter they got from the Consumer Electronics Association, and the question was an interesting question. By the year 2020, does the United States want to be the best broadcast country in the world or the best broadband country in the world? Choose. And their option was, if you don't like being the best broadcast country in the world, let's recapture the frequencies from the UHF television stations, put them out of business, and take their spectrum and make everybody's iPhone work. So this has resonated extremely well on the Hill. And people are, there are 535 people on, on Capitol Hill who are thinking that's really an interesting question. Do we want to be the best broadcast country in the world, or do we want to be the best broadband country in the world by the year 2020? Now, just in case you're wondering, the United States ranks 18th just behind the Czech Republic in internet speed and infrastructure. So we are an already third world country with respect to the information age. But we're in the information age and something crazy has happened just a few weeks ago. And I thought it would be interesting to get everyone here to start thinking about inf like information age citizens, digital citizens of the United States. And in fact, how we might defend the United Networks of America as opposed to the United States of America. Now all of you know that we have 10, I think all of you know, we have 10 Nimitz-class carriers on active duty in the United States. Each battle group has about 7,000 troops, uh, a bunch of warships evolve around these carriers, and they in fact uh, are the most fierce fighting force the planet has ever known. They're extremely good at doing things like scaring the hell out of everybody and making sure that you can sleep at night. That's the blanket of protection the United States military lets us all sleep under. Well. Just a few weeks ago, I'm sure a lot of you know that the United States was brutally and viciously attacked on the West Coast. 30 tech companies, including Google, were hacked by a pair of hackers that came in somewhere out of a province in China. And it was an incredibly targeted, incredibly effective attack. And so effective, in fact, that Google did not know what to do about it. Neither did anybody else. Now, if they had flown a plane directly over towards the power grid, in Northern California, that plane would have been shot out of the air before it got 200 miles near the coast of America. We're great at that. This particular computer attack took out 30 major, I should say this, made an incredible amount of damage at 30 major tech companies who are all about defending themselves against this kind of attack, but they were not capable of doing so. Now the question becomes, in the 21st century, how does the United States know when it's under attack? Google has 64% of all the searches ever done in the history of search. We're no longer in the industrial age, we're in the information age. Information is currency, it's the currency of our century. You could argue that the speed of information being directly equated to economic success is, a success is an old story. Google has a monopoly, complete and total monopoly, on the information that we as a culture use. Our Secretary of State gets on television and says, citizens of the world should act responsibly and they shouldn't send nasty computer viruses to America. We'll sanction you if you're not a good student and or a good citizen. And I thought that was kind of the stupidest thing I'd ever heard in my <laughs> life. And the United States military and the NSA did not know we were under attack and there is no mechanism in place for them to know. So if the power grid were to be attacked by that computer virus, if they decided to take out the IRS's data center, if in fact they wanted to lay waste to the informational infrastructure of the United States, when would the military know it was under attack? And if it did know, exactly what would it do about it and how? So I have a very interesting question going on with uh, my Pentagon clients. And we have analog leadership, we have digital soldiers, and we have a tremendous disconnect between those two ways that people think. We've got people here who are all thinking, well, I don't want to go on Twitter. I don't want to go on Facebook. That's all digital. I'm not going to do that. That's for the kids, or that's for this, or that's for that. As of June 17, 2009, every single form of communication in the United States, with the exception of radio, was 100% digital. You leave an electronic trail everywhere you go. 
Let's use an example that'll make everybody laugh for a second, then we'll get super heavy. If I said to Tiger Woods, Steve, the voicemail message you left, not so smart. Everybody here might agree that wasn't the smartest voicemail <laughs> message ever. <laughs> However, digital is so woven into the fabric of our society that he had no idea that he was living, leaving in a digital audio recording. If I had said to Tiger Woods before he left that voicemail message, Tiger, the stage manager is going to cue you. When he does, you are going to step up to the microphone, please put on your headsets, and I'd like you to leave this audio message you want to leave. It is going on a remote digital server, and you will lose complete control of the master as soon as the recording is finished. Please sign this release, and now would you, three, two, one, leave your voicemail message? Do you think he would have left the same voicemail message? The answer is no. Of course not. Because he doesn't think that way, and neither does anybody else. Every single thing you do, from your viewing habits, to your credit card receipts in the cab, to your credit card receipts in general, 100% of your banking information and 100% of what you do on the internet is available in a database somewhere. Whether you believe you're doing a secure transaction when you buy something from Amazon, no matter what you do, right down to the Google searches, and including every Google search, in fact, you've ever done, is in a database somewhere. Some people are respectful of that, other people aren't. What are they doing to protect it? And when they take it out, what are, what's going to happen? So you ask yourself, has anybody here ever had a situation where you didn't have a Blackberry for a day or you lost your internet connection? Has anybody asked yourself the question, gee, would I rather have a television set in my house at working or would I rather have an online connection, a solid broadband connection in the house? The practical problem we are about to face goes like this. China just said to Google, you're only 36% of, uh, you only are 36% of the search business in China. Uh, the rest is Baidu. We're a government. And here's the scary part. We're a government. Governments have centralized control and governments actually propagandize and control information. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression are constructs of the experiment in government that is the United States of America. Everywhere else, the press and communication is government controlled. And in China, very tightly so. China says to Google, you know what? You have to censor the way we tell you to censor because we're the Chinese government. Those of you who are students of this planet will know flat out that China has a bit of an isolation issue. They've got a big mountain range on one side, a big, big ocean on the other. They actually, if they don't want to bother us, they never have to. If we don't want to bother them, we never need to see them. They've just told Google, we got an idea, censor or leave. Google's like, you know, I can't make any money here, maybe I should go. Now let's just talk about the sociology of the information age for a second and think about governance the way we should all be thinking about governance. In the United States, based on your social media experience and your television choices, it is possible to cocoon yourself in a blanket of information that only you want to hear. If you're a red state person, you can wrap yourself in only red state information and even listen to only the blue state information through the filter of a red state, and vice versa is true. By your social media choices, by your blog reading choices, by your media consumption choices, you as consumers are so in control of your media consumption that you can filter out the entire world. China just got finished, and by the way, the government can do nothing to stop you. This is America. The government can't write a law in this country that says how, what you can and cannot say. Your employers can tell you that, but the government can't. China, on the other hand, is a government that has an extremely effective regime about controlling information to their populace. And they say to Google, hey Google, see ya. Wait a minute. China just creates a database where the information age goes in and nothing's allowed out and they filter what the populace has. They will be the only centralized government on the face of the earth that has control of information online in the 21st century, if we as a society let it. So how would we, as, a, as the free world, say in the information age where information is currency, what would or should we do if they decide that they want to isolate themselves in the information age using technology that we can't isolate ourselves with? The United States couldn't do it. So there's a bunch of options. One, of course, would be to say, hey, guess what, guys? There's a set of C classes. There's a set of internet um, classes that you can, that are the, the physical infrastructure of China. We'll just put up a real wall. You want the, you like the Great Wall of China? We'll put up an internet wall around you guys. You guys can be isolated. We'll isolate you. That would be immense punishment worldwide. Never going to happen. So what is going to happen politically? Where is the government? And where are our governments? Last thought on this whole subject. All of you who use social media every day know that you are in a community of interest. You self-assemble, you self-select what you want to be part of. Whether you're a fan of a sports team, or you're a fan of a particular blogger, or you have a political ideology you're a fan of, or you're a, a member of Al-Qaeda, 
you look the same with your ones and zeros to the self-selected group. In America, we have what's known as designated market areas. There's 213 markets in the United States that are television markets, and they're roughly geographically located around the major cities from 1 to 213 by population size. They're areas. New York is number one. LA is number two. Chicago is number three. Philadelphia is number four, all the way down by population centers. And they're roughly 50-ish miles around the town centers of the biggest markets. In the 21st century, those designations mean nothing. The tyranny of geography means nothing. What do we really have now? We have these atomized, fragmented trust circles, self-selected groups that trust each other, where their information matters. And there's no geographic or temporal restriction to that at all. That is antithetical to a government that wants to be in control. And that is antithetical to a controlled information environment. How can we possibly allow China to get 100% control over their social media, 100% control over the information inside their walls, when no place else on Earth will be able to function that way? How marginalized will other governments be? How marginalized will other information technology organizations be by comparison? So we are in a very strange time. We have new kinds of criminals. We have new kinds of crimes. We have new kinds of wars. We have new kinds of technology. And by the way, just to put this all in perspective, 140,000 years ago, modern humans showed up. And one-to-one -one communication was you were naturally selected to be great at. And we all are pretty good at recognizing faces. Mom holds you in her hand, and she looks at you, and you look at her. And being able to recognize friend and foe and do one-to-one -one communication is what got everybody here today after 140,000 years of natural selection. 30, so one and one, we're great. One-to-one, -one, we're great at. One-to-many, the Greek stage, 3,500 years old, right? 3,500 years is a culture you could argue we're fantastic at. It. I'm talking, you're listening, no one's throwing tomatoes. We understand the conventions of one-to-many. And one-to-many comes in small groups and bigger groups. That's 3,500 years old. We're great at that. Television is the highest form of that. And I hate to say it, being the president of the Emmy Awards here in New York, I can tell you that the 30-second TV spot is the highest form of that art. It's got a beginning, middle, and ending, a rising action climax, and a falling action. In 30 seconds, 5 million bucks of production, $100 million on air, and you guys are going to buy stuff you don't want with money you don't have. We love that. 27 months ago, two new things happened that have absolutely never happened before in the history of mankind. And they're fascinating. One is many to one which we don't have physiology to deal with. In fact, the only human being I've ever seen with that kind of physiology is a kindergarten teacher. There's 30 kids around screaming at her. Magically, she knows which kid needs the most, we don't raise their hands. But once you get 300 kids, it doesn't work, and 3,000 kids, it doesn't work, and 30,000 kids, it really doesn't work. And at the same time, we had a new artifact called Many to Many, which you absolutely need a tool set to deal with. 140,000 years of one-to-one -one communication, we're experts. 3,500 years of one-to-many, killer. 27 months of many to one and many to many. We have to suck at it, and we really do. Wow. By the way, that was totally extemporaneous because he was giving marching orders today, like at two o'clock, to do that. So, just wanted to. So anyway, I don't know that I don't know if that's a statement, a question, or a fact. It's just a state of the union, state of the information union. So uh, you want to debate it, we debate it. I don't have any answers, and no one else in this room does either. You may ask me, but I can promise you I don't have an answer. I just have questions and lots of them. <laughs>